from its humble beginnings as a Roman fort to its apex as a second city of the empire, to its deindustrialization and into its current form. This is the story of Glasgow. Thank you for being here. Please like, comment and subscribe. Let's go. The earliest origins of Glasgow can be traced back to the Roman period, when a fort called Vindigara was built in the early 1st century AD. The fort was likely used to control the local tribes and protect the Roman Empire's northern frontier. The modern city of Glasgow, however, was not founded until the 6th century AD, when a Christian missionary named St Mungo established a church on the site of a Roman fort. Over time, the small settlement that grew around the church became known as Glasgow, which is the origin of the city's modern name. Scotland, known as Caledonia during Roman times, was a wild and largely untamed land that was considered to be on the northern fringes of the Roman Empire. The Romans did not fully conquer or occupy Scotland, but they did build a series of forts and outposts along the southern and eastern coasts, as well as a network of roads to help them control the local tribes and protect their empire's northern frontier. The local tribes in Scotland during the Roman times were largely made up of fierce warriors who resisted Roman expansion into their territories. This, along with the rugged and inaccessible terrain of much of Scotland, made it a difficult and costly area for the Romans to conquer and control. As a result, Roman influence in Scotland was limited and their presence was mainly focused on the southern and eastern parts of the country. During the Roman Empire, the west of Scotland was primarily inhabited by the Damanoni tribe, this tribe was part of the Britonic speaking people of what is today Scotland, England and Wales, and were one of the tribes that the Romans encountered in their efforts to conquer and control the area. According to Roman historians, the Damnoni were considered to be a warlike people who fiercely resisted Roman expansion into their territory. There were other tribes in the area as well, such as the Selgovae and the Votadini both of which were part of the same Britonic-speaking people. The Selgovae were located in the southern uplands of Scotland, while the Votadini were located in an area that's now known as the Scottish Borders. It's worth noting that the tribes in the area around Glasgow were not unified political entities, but rather they were made up of smaller, independent communities who had their own leaders. St Mungo was one of a wave of missionaries who are said to have brought Christianity to Scotland in the 6th century AD. He was a missionary and a bishop, and according to legend, he was sent to the area that is now Glasgow by St Serf, another missionary to spread the Christian faith amongst the local tribes. St Mungo established a church in the area of the Roman fort of Vindergara and began preaching to the local people. He is said to have converted many to Christianity and to have performed many miracles, such as healing the sick and raising the dead. He also founded a monastic community, and his church became an important centre for Christianity in Scotland. It's worth noting that the historical accounts of St Mungo's life and mission are somewhat legend-based, and it's hard to determine how much of it is factual. Nevertheless, he is considered to be one of the patron saints of Glasgow and his legacy is an important part of the city's history and culture. It's also crucial to note that St Mungo was not the first person to bring Christianity to Scotland but was part of a swath of Christian missionaries who came to Scotland and helped establish it Christianity as the dominant religion in the area. Christianity grew to become the main religion of Scotland in a gradual process that took over several centuries. Other important missionaries include St Ninian and St Columba, who also worked to convert the local tribes. These early Christian missionaries built churches, monasteries and other religious institutions which served as important centres of learning, culture and religious practice. They also established a network of bishops, priests and other religious leaders who helped spread Christianity throughout Scotland. Additionally, they also used their religious authority to gain support from local leaders and rulers, which helped further establish Christianity as a dominant religion in the area. By the 8th century, Christianity had become well established in Scotland and many of the local tribes had converted to the faith. 
However, it was not until the reign of King Kenneth MacAlpin in the 9th century that the process of unifying Scotland under one king and one religion was completed. Over the centuries, Christianity in Scotland evolved and developed its own distinct traditions and practices, and it played an important role in shaping culture, history and identity of Glasgow and Scotland. Glasgow's church became known as the Mother Church of Glasgow and grew to become an important centre of Christianity in the country. As the church grew, so did the community. People began to settle in the area around the church and over time a small village developed. This village, known as Glasgow, became a hub of trade and commerce and it attracted merchants, artisans and other tradespeople. The village grew in size and importance over the centuries and in the year 1175 AD it became a royal borough under the reign of William the Lion or William I. A royal borough is a Scottish town or village that was granted a royal charter by the King or Queen of Scotland. This charter granted the town certain rights and privileges such as the right to hold markets and trade fairs and the right to elect a town council to govern the town. The grant of a royal charter to Glasgow would have been a significant event in the town's history as it would have allowed the town to expand and develop as a centre of trade and commerce. The charter would have also granted the town certain legal and political rights which would have given the people of the town more control over their own affairs. The term Royal Borough was abolished in 1975 but it is still considered a historical title and important to the history of Glasgow and Scotland. Many towns and villages in Scotland including Glasgow still hold the title as a historical designation and the rights and privileges granted by the original charters are still recognised today. During the Middle Ages, Glasgow continued to grow and expand. The town's location on the River Clyde made it an important trading area and it became a hub for the export of wool and other goods. The town also grew in importance as a religious centre, with several monasteries and churches being established in the area. In 1451, the University of Glasgow was founded by Pope Nicholas V. Overall, the growth and expansion of Glasgow from a small church to a town and later to a city was a gradual process that was driven by a combination of religious, economic and political factors. In the 18th century, Glasgow experienced a period of rapid growth and industrialisation, which saw the city grow into a major centre of shipbuilding, engineering and textiles. This period of expansion and growth with the development of the merchant class was a key factor in the city's development and expansion as a city. Glasgow was also a hub of anti-Jacobite activity during the 1700s. The Jacobite Rising, also known as the Jacobite Rebellion, was a series of uprisings that took place in Scotland and England between 1715 and 1746, with the goal of restoring the Stuart monarchy to the British throne. The Jacobite cause was led by James Francis Edward Stuart, commonly known as the Old Pretender, and his son Charles Edward Stuart, also known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. During this period, Glasgow was a centre of the anti-Jacobite movement, and as a result it prospered. The city's merchants, tradespeople and artisans were largely opposed to the Jacobite cause, as they feared that the restoration of the Stuart monarchy would disrupt trade and commerce. They also feared that the Jacobites would impose a Catholic monarchy on Scotland, which would threaten their Protestant faith. As a result, Glasgow's leaders and citizens supported the government of the day and the Hanoverian dynasty, which was opposed to the Jacobites. They provided financial support and troops to the government and they helped organise anti-Jacobite rallies and demonstrations in the cities. Glasgow's support for the government was rewarded with economic benefits. The city's trade and commerce continued to flourish as the government provided contracts and subsidies to Glasgow's merchants, tradespeople and artisans. The city also became an important centre of manufacturing as the government encouraged the development of new technologies and industries such as textiles, shipbuilding and engineering. In addition to these economic benefits, Glasgow's support for the government also helped establish the city as a centre of political and cultural influence in Scotland. The city's leaders and citizens played an important role in shaping the cultural and political landscape of the country and they helped establish Glasgow as a major hub of trade, commerce, industry and culture in Scotland. But let's take a broader look at why Glasgow became an important city. 
Glasgow became an important city for several reasons. One of the main reasons is its location on the River Clyde, which made it an ideal location for trade and shipping. The River Clyde provided access to the sea, which allowed for the export of goods and the import of raw materials, making it a prime location to do business. This helped to grow Glasgow's power and laid the foundation for the city's later industrial development. Another reason for Glasgow's importance was the availability of natural resources like coal and iron. These resources were essential for the development of new technologies and industries such as textiles, shipbuilding and engineering. The city's access to these resources made it an ideal location for the growth of manufacturing which helped to drive its industrialisation. Glasgow's importance also increased with the growth of population. The city's population grew rapidly in the 18th and 19th centuries as people migrated to the city in search of work and better living conditions. This growth in population helped create a large growing market for goods and services which helped in turn drive the city's industrial development. Glasgow's importance was also due to the vision and initiative of its leaders and citizens. Throughout its history, Glasgow had been a city of innovation and enterprise, with a tradition of taking risks and embracing new opportunities. This entrepreneurial spirit helped to attract investment and talent to the city, and it played a key role in its transformation from small town to an industrialised city. The combination of these factors helped Glasgow become a major centre of trade, commerce and industry, and culture in Scotland, and one of the most important cities in the United Kingdom. In the late 19th and early 20th century, Glasgow was known as the second city of the empire. Glasgow had a diverse range of industries, including shipbuilding, textiles, engineering and chemicals, which made it one of the most important industrial cities in the British Empire. The city's shipyards produced some of the largest and most advanced ships of the time, and its engineers and technicians were renowned for their skill and innovation. Glasgow's industries and commerce were supported by a large and diverse population, which provided a skilled workforce and a consumer market for the city's goods and services. The city's prosperity and influence were also reflected in its architecture and culture, with the city being home to many grand buildings and cultural institutions. This made Glasgow a global hub for trade and commerce and culture that helped the British Empire grow and solidify its power. During World War I, Glasgow played a significant role as a major industrial and logistical centre for the British war effort. The city's shipyards and engineering works produced a large number of ships and weapons and other equipment for the British military. It also was a major centre for the production of munitions and the women of Glasgow played a key role in this industry. Glasgow also served as a major centre for recruitment and training, with many soldiers and sailors being recruited and trained in the city before being sent to the front lines. During World War II, Glasgow's role was similar to that of World War I, with the city's industries once again playing a key role in the war effort. The shipyards and the engineering works produced a large number of ships, weapons and other equipment, and the city was also a major centre for the production of munitions and other war materials. Glasgow was heavily bombed during the war and many of the city's residents were forced to evacuate to the countryside. However, the city's industries continued to operate throughout the war and the people of Glasgow played an important role in the war effort. In both World War I and World War II, Glasgow's role as an industrial powerhouse was essential to the war effort. The city's industries worked day and night and made a significant contribution and helped the British and Allies win the wars. But in the coming decades, the role of Glasgow was to diminish. Deindustrialisation refers to the process by which a region or country shifts away from its industrial base and towards a more service based economy. In the case of Glasgow, deindustrialisation began in the mid 20th century and continued into the 21st century. One of the main reasons for deindustrialisation in Glasgow was the decline of the traditional heavy industries that had been the backbone of the city's economy for many years. The shipbuilding, engineering and textile industries, which had once been the mainstay of Glasgow's economy, saw a significant decline in the latter half of the 20th century. This was due to a combination of factors, including increased competition from foreign manufacturers, changes in consumer demand and technological advancements that made these industries less profitable. In addition to the decline of traditional industries, deindustrialisation was also driven by changes in government economic policy. 
the British government implemented policies that encouraged the closure of unprofitable industries and reduced subsidies and tariffs that had supported the heavy industries in Glasgow. The deindustrialization of Glasgow had a significant impact on the city's economy and society. Many people lost their jobs as a result of factory closures and unemployment rates rose. This led to an increase in poverty and social problems such as crime, drug abuse and homelessness. Additionally, many of the large, imposing industrial buildings that had defined Glasgow's landscape fell into disrepair or were demolished, leaving behind large areas of derelict land. However, the city has undergone a regeneration process since the 80s and 90s, and Glasgow has been able to diversify its economy and attract new industries and businesses, such as the service sector, tourism and creative industries. The city has also been successful in attracting new residents and tourists and has seen a significant improvement in the quality of life for its residents. One of the most notable changes in modern Glasgow is the revitalisation of the city centre. In the past, the city centre was known for its rundown buildings and high crime rates, but in recent years, a significant amount of money has been invested in regeneration projects. This has led to the redevelopment of many of the city's historic buildings and the construction of new, modern buildings, The city centre is now a popular destination for shopping, dining, entertainment and has a wide variety of restaurants, shops and bars. Another important aspect of modern Glasgow is its strong cultural scene. The city is home to a number of world-class museums and galleries, including the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and the Transport Museum. The city also has a thriving music and arts scene, with a number of venues showcasing local and international talent. Glasgow is also known for its parks and green spaces. The city has a number of parks and gardens that are popular with residents and visitors alike, including Kelvin Grove Park and the Glasgow Botanic Gardens. The economy of Glasgow is diverse, with a strong focus on services. Overall, modern Glasgow is a city that has undergone significant changes in recent years and has managed to reinvent itself as a vibrant, dynamic city with a strong sense of culture and community so there we have it thank you for watching thank you for listening if you're if you're driving or something it's great to have you here that was the history of glasgow from from i think the most relevant point in its history it's starting history i mean up till now i'm sure there was a village there before maybe before the romans who knows But um, Glasgow has got some really interesting, distinct points in its history from early era era as a Roman fortress, then from St Mungo establishing a a church there, then the village that grew around that centre, so it became a sort of religious centre um, with with a village, then as it grew through the Middle Ages, beginning its royal borough status, then attracting more business and commerce with the River Clyde, and then it as it slightly began to industrialise in the 1700s, then became an industrial powerhouse right up until it became the second city of the empire in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then it's deindustrialization, and it's re- now it's regenera- regeneration to its current form today. So some very distinct blocks of history there. It's um, I, I don't know what the future holds for Glasgow. It certainly seems to be in quite a good place right now. There's lots of building happening, lots of in, lots of new properties getting built, lots of commercial property getting built, big plans to change parts of the city as well, develop it and, and keep growing it. So hopefully the future is bright for Glasgow. It's always a shame, though, to note the deindustrialization because it was such a powerful, incredible city back then. And deindustrialization, you know, destroyed so many lives. It's an absolute tragic history there. So, um, but we can we can see that it's in a better place now. There's not as much crime and poverty as there was, but there's obviously still some major issues in the city. But thank you again. I'm glad you're here. And um, please leave a comment. Please subscribe. Please like the video. All that helps. And feel free to recommend other ideas for videos about Glasgow and about Scotland and about history. Like it has focused so far on kind of like imperial history. So I would like to keep it in that niche, but I'm also considering some more medieval stuff because medieval history is just cool. But imperial history of Scotland especially is, there's not much stuff out there on it. So I'm trying to fill that gap, but we'll see how it goes. Thank you.